Hello everyone, my name is Rick McCann, Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Private Officer International and Armor College. I want to welcome each and every one of you to today's webinar, Defiant, Disruptive, and Armed. The climate of American policing and providing private security services is rapidly changing, as you know, and it's making it very challenging these days to be able to protect the public our clients, and the billions of dollars worth of property that we're responsible for across the country and around the world. For the past five years, as you know, there's been an increase of protest, civil defiance and disobedience, non-compliancy, and just an overall disrespect for personal space or private property, authority, law enforcement, or anything that resembles uh, government and private security um, is in the middle of this. We're seeing across the country that during these protests and defiance and issues involving people that are non-compliant, many are using force against law enforcement and security. So I thought that it was very important at, and very timely at this moment to address a number of situations occurring across the country. But before we get started, I do want to make it clear, and I want to clearly state that this training is not about race, nor is it about any one group, but it is about the disruption of commerce, business, events. It is about the dangers that these disruptions pose to the peacekeepers who must protect the freedoms of our country, the Constitution, while protecting the safety of our community, clients, staff, visitors, our properties, and of course, most importantly, ourselves. Having said that, I'd like to begin the webinar today by addressing the true issues of what we're seeing across the country. Private security and private law enforcement officers have again been thrusted into the crossroads of having to perform a task often without the proper training or even the clear understanding of what the laws are that apply to these situations while trying to protect themselves and others. It is very important to have the fundamental skills when we're dealing with these type of situations. So let's look at a couple of definitions so that you have a clear understanding as to how to differentiate between somebody who's just being a pain in the butt and someone who truly is being disruptive. There are three forms of public bad behavior that we're faced with on a regular basis. I call them the three D's of destruction, and I'll explain that during this webinar. But let's start with the first one, and that is disruptive behavior. Now, disruptive behavior in any environment, especially those surrounding public venues, public space, can be a real headache. They can be uh, something that is um, disturbing our peace or the event. But there are two forms of being disruptive. Disruptive can be non-voluntary. So, you may have somebody who's burping or letting off gas in the middle of a concert or a meeting or church. You could have someone who is whispering to their neighbor, someone who's sneezing or coughing because they have a head cold. Is that a disruption? Of course, it is, but it's not criminal, nor is it intentional, and we can understand that they're not trying to disturb anyone, but if it 
continues, it may be a situation where we need to address it. And then you have the intentional actions that disrupts a class, a business, an event, a church, a gathering, a public space. These intentional acts are the ones that we have to manage every day. And in order to do that, we need to understand what we can and cannot do and what the laws are pertaining to this. So what are some of the intentional disruptions? First, we, we want to go over to look at the true definitions of disruptions. And we're talking about purposeful actions. They purposely are committing these actions for no other reason than to disturb those around them and create chaos or disruption of business, church, or other public event. And some of these examples would be yelling, throwing things, Cursing, threatening. These can be minor or major in nature. Even though they are an intentional act, they may be very minor. It may be somebody who is raising their voice because they're upset with the clerk at the store. Raising their voice, maybe even making passive threats during uh, a situation at a grocery store, at a coffee shop. This is bad behavior. Does it rise to the level of a criminal act? In most cases, the corrective action is going to be that we're going to give them a verbal warning. And usually that's all that's needed for them to cease their disruptive behavior. And if it doesn't, then we have to escalate how we're going to handle that situation. When someone is yelling, cussing, or threatening in public, it could be considered a disturbance or the next uh, elevation of that could even be uh, a criminal charge. You know, there's always going to be that exception to the rule. Instead of just a verbal warning, they may push that issue and actually bump it up to the next level of non-compliancy where they're not listening. They're not obeying your directive. And it turns into a disorderly conduct, especially if they're threatening if they are challenging your authority and creating a disturbance in public space. And this is where it really becomes very challenging for the security officer to either hold their ground and meet the resistance with calm yet stern level-headedness and non-threatening communication, or it could cause the officer to completely lose their cool threaten the person, or even use unnecessary force. When you've got someone in your face being defiant, someone who is not adhering to your directions, someone who is not listening to you, some people who just can't handle that, some security officers who may not be level-headed, may have a temper, could fly off the handle, could cause that to escalate even further into a physical assault or unnecessary and illegal use of force. So what do you do in this situation? They have to stay on their ground. They have to be able to communicate non-threatening they have to try to be more understanding, and we want to use verbal judo, and we also want to use de-escalation techniques to quell this disruptive person. 
But if the security officer is not trained in these techniques, they will not be able to deliver them. They will not be able to um, quell or subside this disruptive person through communication. Teach your personnel the true techniques of verbal judo. Teach them some de-escalation techniques. Understanding. Yes, I understand. Listening. Active listening is very important. Teach them how to communicate. You may have to ask the person to come outside so that you can communicate better. You may have to ask that person to come aside. Let's get this situation worked out and, and let's step aside here and, and talk it over. It's all about how the person communicates. It's all about the tone in their voice. What happens if the person is still non-compliant, still disruptive? At that point, the officer will definitely need to get additional support, whether that be from additional security personnel to help remove this person from the property or by calling law enforcement. We're going to talk a little bit coming up about private property, but in this situation, if the person is completely non-compliant, not listening even after attempting de-escalation techniques or verbal judo, that person can be removed from the property, public or private space, for their disruptions. And if they do not want to cooperate, if they do not want to adhere to what you're telling them at that point, then yes, you do, you do have to get law enforcement involved. There's going to be situations that you will be able to handle without any problem. But there will be other situations when you will need additional resources. The next level, the next D in the three D's that we're talking about is disorderly conduct. And disorderly conduct is an escalated form of disruption. And usually that in every state is a criminal offense, a misdemeanor. Usually involving unruly behavior, an intoxicated person, somebody who is threatening bodily harm, somebody who is disturbing the peace, pushing, assaulting, or abusive behavior. It's one thing to have a gripe. It's one thing to want to protest about some wrongdoing that you think is occurring. It's one thing for you to want to speak your mind and clear the air and tell people just how you feel about a situation. But if you're threatening bodily harm, if you are pushing, if you are creating a disturb disturbance, if you are creating what the law says is an alarm, a panic to the public, then at that point, it's a criminal charge, a criminal incident, and a person can be definitely charged. This escalated form of disruption is really very hazardous to the public. It's really very hazardous to the responding officer and to everyone involved. Because when you have Somebody who is disruptive, disorderly, non-compliant, they're not going to listen to you, they're not going to listen to anyone, then you have someone who could easily escalate that into bodily, physical assault. Disorderly conduct involves battery, disruption of business, disruption of meetings, events, church, as I mentioned a second ago, any behavior that causes an alarm, a panic, chaos, or is threatening to the public, if the person is intoxicated, then it's a criminal offense. In these situations, it is important to assess who it is you're dealing with. Are they intoxicated? Are they under the influence of narcotics? Are they 
mentally unstable. Is that the reason why they're yelling, threatening, causing a disturbance? One of the key elements of use of force or even making an arrest is an assessment. An assessment of all things considered. The totality of the situation, the totality of the incident, including the individual, the disturbance, what might be causing it, why is the person being disruptive, disorderly, is it something out of his control, is he just intoxicated out of his mind, is it someone who has a true medical mental health emergency, and each one of these will have to deal with differently. If it's someone who, for no other reason but to be disruptive and disorderly, is causing a problem, then we're going to deal with him in a much stricter, sterner way than we're going to deal with someone who has a mental health issue, and he just is there, and, and maybe he just can't help himself. The totality of the situation. Do we get the police involved? Do we call for backup? The corrective action should be verbal uh, communication, de-escalation, a warning, verbal warning. And if the disorderly person is creating such a ruckus that it's a threat, it's uh, a disturbance to everyone around, then at that point we do have to remove them. And we can do that with additional security support or we may have to call law enforcement. Um, and I always... Caution people, if you have to call law enforcement or if you have to call hands-on, do not allow that person to leave. Once you go hands-on with a person, once you take somebody in custody, you've got to follow through with criminal charges because if you don't, you've just opened the door wide open to liability. And once you've gone hands-on, in most states, that's an assault. There are a few states, such as Florida, that allow private security to physically remove someone who is trespassing. But most states do not have that law. And if you go hands-on with a person and you physically pull them off the property, pull them, push them off the door, you have technically battered in some states or assaulted the person in some states. So you must go ahead and process charges against them. Prosecute that person for disorderly conduct or criminal trespass. If you don't, that door to liability, it's going to be wide open, and at that point, it's going to be a little bit too late to close it. The next D, the third D, is defiant behavior. We've talked about disruptive, we've talked about disorderly, and now we've got to look at the escalated form of really not only bad, bad behavior, but somebody who is dangerous. And again, this all starts with assessment, being able to assess what's happening, who's involved, the totality of the situation, what can happen if we don't step in. A defiant behavior, somebody who is extremely, extremely disorderly, disruptive, non-compliant, who's challenging your authority or anyone else's. Their intentions, more than likely, is going to be criminal. Their intentions is to resist law enforcement and security. And it may even at times escalate to the extreme riotous stage of lawlessness. lawlessness. Again, defiant behavior is not somebody who's just upset. He's not someone who's uh, complaining because he didn't get the proper sandwich at the restaurant, he's not happy with something that's going on at the department store, the defiant behavior situation is going to be extreme, extreme type of disorderly conduct, extreme, disruptive, non-compliant person. And in that stage, they're ready, very ready to assault, to strike out to attack and you have to be really ready for what might come your way. We've seen over the last five years 
situation after situation where protests have kicked off because someone wasn't happy about something, whether that be law enforcement involved shooting or something that's going on within their community. In the last five years, we've seen a lot of protesting, and it's not all legal protesting. The situation that occurred in Ferguson, Missouri, Baltimore, Maryland, Charlotte, North Carolina, Philadelphia, Nashville, Tennessee, a lot of other places where protesters took over interstates, smashed out windows, burnt down buildings, that's not a protest. This is not freedom of speech. This is not someone who is just trying to get the world to understand that they're not happy with the situation. It is not civil protesting. It is a riot. It is the extreme defiant person. And it's very, very dangerous. So, at this point, you're probably asking yourself, what has this got to do with private security? Isn't this a, a, a police matter? Why should I be concerned? In 2017, so far, 19 security officers have been assaulted during protests. One of those security officers was stabbed. That's so far this year. After the Ferguson riots, Black Lives Matter protesters hit the streets, the highways, and the businesses, including shopping malls, not only to protest, but to disrupt traffic, to disrupt life in general, shopping, commerce, people. They oftentimes took over streets and highways. They broke the laws. They didn't allow free-flowing traffic. They interfered with commerce, with the interstate, which is a federal crime, and yet there wasn't much done about it. Who is in the mix? Every place you go these days, there are private security officers. Every place that you look, every shopping mall, every hotel, every music venue, every uh, factory, every uh, railway, bus station, school, you have private security and private law enforcement on the front line. So why is this important? Well, because there's almost 2 million private security officers. And every place that there's a protest, every place there's a strike, there's going to be private security officers involved. During Hurricane Katrina, many people do not realize, may not have heard, that during Katrina, three security officers were shot to death during looting and the resettlement phase of New Orleans. Three security officers standing the ground, protecting life and property, while others fleed the city. Security officers were still on duty and one security officer was shot to death during the resettlement phase of New Orleans. When we're dealing with defiant people, when we're dealing with disruptive people, we have to be well prepared to try to de-escalate it or to respond with the necessary force to protect ourselves and others while enforcing property rules and the law. During the Dallas sniper attack, where five police officers were killed July the 8th in 2016, the gunman first had entered the El Centro College, located right downtown in the heart of where the protest was being held. The gunman entered through the college. Five college classes and several continuing education classes were still in progress when that gunman entered the school. And at 8 p.m., as protesters marched by the school, one of them blended in with the crowd and gained access 
into the college when confronted by campus security and police. He began shooting at them as he made his way into the parking structure. Two officers inside the school were pinned down for several hours. Employees, staff, students, officers, all in that college, all pinned down. No place to go, <clears throat> no place to run, no help on the way. When it was all said and done, five police officers lay dead. This was not someone who was disruptive. This was not someone who was just disorderly. This was someone who was completely defiant. Not only did he resist the security and the campus police officers' efforts to stop him from entering the school, but he was dead set on killing as many police officers as he could that day. And when he entered into the parking structure, he had no intent of leaving alive. September 20th, 2016, in Charlotte, North Carolina, police shot and killed an armed black man. But... The fact that he was armed did not matter to many citizens. They began to protest. They began to riot and loot the downtown city of Charlotte. Charlotte has a population in the city of about 900,000, about 2 million in the metro area. During this time, they broke in to venues, restaurants, bars, a vibrant city, a vibrant downtown alive with entertainment, clubs, restaurants, and music venues. Lots of security officers work in this downtown area. There's a lot of foot traffic, a lot of entertainment, a lot of different people almost any night of the week. And when the riot came into downtown, there were security officers on duty. The National Guard was called out within two days. During the riot, several security officers were assaulted. Businesses were set afire, burglarized, looted. Security officers in major businesses, such as the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, had to activate their lockdown procedures. Very important that you have emergency plans in place. Very important that you have a lockdown procedure. You don't have to be a school. You don't have to be a church. Every business should have a lockdown procedure for situations not only involving active shooter, but also involving disruptive, disorderly situations where people could be harmed. You need to have a location that you can go into, secure, and protect yourself until law enforcement can provide resources to, to take care of those situations. Now what I'm about to talk about next may strike a, a sour note for some people. And they may not understand what I'm about to say. But in the U.S. today, we have, in the last three years, even before President Trump was elected, begun loosening gun laws. And that's great. The Second Amendment, we're not going to argue what it says and what it doesn't say. But the Second Amendment clearly identifies our rights to own and have firearms. But in the last couple of years, many violent confrontations, protests, have now gone armed. And regardless of where you stand on the Second Amendment, this has brought violent confrontations between protesters and the police and security officers. Because now, 
we're not just dealing with disorderly conduct. We're not dealing with disruptive behavior. We're dealing with armed, defiant persons. In recent confrontations in North Dakota over some construction issues and, and things that's happening out there, there was a huge protest. Everyone was carrying firearms. During a similar situation in Oklahoma this year, big protest, security and law enforcement participating in keeping the peace, but many of those protesters were armed. This brings a whole new element into disruptive, defiant situations. I wish I could sit here and tell you, oh, don't worry about it because everybody's level-headed. Don't worry about it because they're carrying AKs. Don't worry about it because they have three guns on their waist, on their belt, as several people did have during these protests, both <clears throat> long rifle and sidearms. People are not level-headed. And when people are upset or they want to prove a point or they want to be disruptive, defiant, those firearms do make a difference. They do elevate that threat to law enforcement and security. And it needs to be uh, something that we train for, something that we um, are aware of and be prepared for to defend ourselves with deadly force if necessary. Do you even know what the gun laws are in your states? Many people do not. Many people still believe it's illegal to carry a firearm, uh, to open carry a firearm, and in many states it's not. In fact, in the last three years, in many states they have enacted what's called constitutional carry. And constitutional carry is a, a state that does not no longer, it doesn't any longer uh, require a concealed weapons permit. No training, no application, no CWP, no concealed weapons permit. Anyone not prohibited from carrying a firearm, 18 or older, can carry a firearm concealed without a permit in Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, Idaho, Kansas, Maine, Mississippi, Missouri, New Hampshire, North Dakota, Vermont, West Virginia, and Wyoming. And the pending states include Alabama and North Carolina. Now you have people carrying concealed you don't know who they are. You don't know if they're trained. Uh, we just don't know. But constitutional carry is a good thing for those who are not a felon, those who are not criminals, those who don't have criminal intent, those who are level-headed. But I'm only bringing this up to let you know that that's another element that you have to be concerned about. That's another element that could be involved in these disruptive, disorderly, defiant situations. Open carry, which means that you can openly carry your firearm on your belt, is available in 31 states. They allow open carry of a handgun without any license or permit. And in some states, you can even carry long guns and it is important to note that these laws apply to public space and private property unless otherwise noted, restricted, or prohibited by law. So how do we prepare to address those who might disrupt a business where we are providing security. 
those who might become disorderly or even defiant, not willing to reason, not willing to listen, and not willing to leave the property under command. Private property laws in the U.S. allow for the owner of any property or their agent to have someone removed from the property after they've been told to leave or charged with criminal trespass. There are three methods of notifying a person that they are no longer welcomed on your property. The laws differ from state to state. So it's important that you know your state statute. Not only understand what your rights are, but know the law, know the statute, understand the verbiage, the legal definition of trespassing. But in most states, there are three methods to notify the person that they are no longer welcome. One, you verbally can tell them to leave the property. If they do not leave after being told to leave and they remain on the property, in most states, that's criminal trespassing and they can be charged accordingly. In some states, it requires that you send them a letter. So how do you do that? They're not going to give you their identification. So law enforcement must step in and identify that person for you and give you the pertinent information so that you can send them via registered mail a letter saying they are no longer welcomed at XYZ company address, so on and so forth, and include the term one year, five years, forever. The third way that you can notify a person is through signage, posting. Many of you, I'm sure, are hunters, and oftentimes you get off on private property, and there are big yellow signs that say, no hunting, private property. You go ahead and hunt, and you've committed uh, two criminal offenses. One, the criminal offense of trespassing, and two, hunting on private property after notice. Your notice was those yellow signs, private property. So there are three ways to notify someone they're not welcome. One, verbally. Two, in writing. And the third way is by posting or by notice, signage. If you have a situation where a person is disorderly, disruptive, again, they really fall into two categories. Minor, minor offenses. He was just being, uh, you know, disturbing he was just being a teenager. They were just having a, you know, little argument. That's a little different than somebody who is majorly causing a disruption or being disorderly by threatening, pushing, assaulting, uh, causing great alarm. So in those situations, you might want to just give them a verbal warning and say, hey, you know, go cool down, chill out. You can come back next week. Someone who is being disorderly, threatening, assaulting, that person you may want to issue a written trespass not to come back for one year. You keep a copy of that trespass, take their photo, and that way if they do come back during uh, that year, before the year expires, that you could determine whether or not to charge them with trespassing. Or you may just want to go ahead if they were really causing disruption, if they really were threatening and causing great alarm, you may want to have them arrested immediately for trespassing and disorderly conduct. Every state, the statutes are going to be different. Different. Make sure that you are aware, that you study the law. How else can we prepare or prevent or defeat or protect against these type of situations? I always tell people, make sure that you have two things in place. Number one, you have a great, robust emergency plan that covers all emergencies, weather-related, active shooters, fires, medical, and disruptive, disorderly, defiant incidents. They're becoming more and more. 
We're seeing across the country these incidents are happening on a regular, almost daily basis someplace. And security officers on the front line are the ones having to deal with it. Make sure that your emergency plan is robust enough to include what should they do. Do you have a safe room? Do you have some place where folks within your building could go if things got out of hand? Number two, you got to have good policies and procedures. Training must be in place to be able to have your security personnel respond appropriately and hopefully de-escalate the situation if possible, but if not, be able to assess the threat quick enough and get additional resources, law enforcement, additional security to back them up and to take care of the situation. What are our rights beyond that? What else should we do? How do we handle complete takeovers when protesters come in and they take over the shopping mall, they take over the hospital, they take over the business? What do we do? How do we handle it? It all boils down to one word, something that I've mentioned three or four times at least during this webinar, and that is assessment. Once we determine that we have an overwhelming situation, a large crowd, what's large? Large could be five or six or ten. It could be a hundred. It could be more. You'll have to assess and determine, is this more than what our security staff can handle? Is this more than what we have trained for? In the recent years, we have had an opportunity to train a number of companies, internal security staff, um, first responders, and contract security companies with how to assess and respond to civil disobedience. Now, civil disobedience is a little bit more than disruptive disorderly conduct. It's the defiant. It gets into that defiant area where it becomes riotous. Anyone who is non-compliant, when you have a large group, any of them who are non-compliant, being disruptive, not following directions and not leaving the property, that does turn into a legal riot. It doesn't have to be looting and firebombing. It could be verbal. Uh, it could be threatening in a large crowd, causing panic, alarm, chaos. That becomes a legal riot. So assessment, it all boils down to that one word. Get a good assessment as quickly as possible. If these people, if these protesters, if these trespassers are defiant, they are loud, threatening, non-compliant, will not listen, will not leave the property, then it's time for you to get additional resources. And when you do, call 911. Make sure that you tell them what's going on. How many people do you believe are involved? What is your estimate of the number? Because they're going to need to dispatch appropriate resources. If you've got 50 people who are yelling and screaming in the lobby of your hotel, and they're being defiant, and they're being argumentative, and they're not leaving, and the police only dispatch one or two police cars, that's not going to be enough. So you want to give them accurate information. Ma'am, I've got 50 people in the lobby. They're upset over uh, an ejection that we had last night when we ejected a trespasser. They're threatening. They're refusing to leave. Now, the appropriate number of law enforcement can be dispatched. The appropriate resources can be sent to assist you in removing or, if necessary, arresting those who are trespassing and creating the disturbance. Assessment. Teach your people about assessment and make sure that they understand the difference between disruptive, what is intentional and not intentional, disorderly conduct, to what degree or level must it reach to be a criminal offense, and what the difference is between that and just 
defiant, someone who just is not going to be compliant, who is not going to listen, who does not recognize your authority and will not leave the property. It is really important in this day and age to really have a good prepared method. We can talk about training, we can talk about um, having policies and procedures, but if we're not practicing, if we're not regularly, at least every six months, going over what we would do in this situation, what would we do in that scenario, if we're not prepping properly for a response then a situation could happen, and even though we have policies and procedures, and even though we have uh, trained staff, we haven't really had an exercise. We haven't really had a drill. We haven't practiced what to do, and it could cause us to fumble through this whole situation and make things worse, even have people injured. So it's important that when you do have an emergency plan, when you do have policies and procedures, that you practice. I, you know, whenever I teach about active shooter, I tell people uh, this same story. We trained all of our young lives in school for fire drills. And fires across the country uh, rarely happen in schools. Less than 5% of the injuries or deaths of students was the cause of a fire. But we don't train and we don't drill and we don't prepare for active shooters and disruptive, disorderly, or defiant people. But unfortunately, there are more of them than there are emergency fire situations or um, other emergencies where we might have to evacuate the building. So it's important once you have these plans and procedures in place that we begin training on different scenarios and situations that could take place and how we would, as a security staff or private law enforcement, uh, how would we you know, respond to these situations? Are we prepared? Do we have the right equipment? Do we have the right amount of staff? So in opening up the webinar, I said that these are the three Ds of destruction, disruptive, disorderly, and defiant. The three Ds of disruption, disorderly, defiant. Three Ds of destruction. All of these could lead to destruction. Destruction from the standpoint of property being destroyed. Destruction from the standpoint of uh, people being injured, their lives destroyed, maybe even killed. And destruction from the standpoint of that if we don't do things exactly how we should, if we're ill-prepared and we're ill-trained and we are the escalator instead of the de-escalator in these situations, it could destroy not only our own personal life through lawsuit, it could destroy the company we work for, it could destroy the client having to defend themselves in a multi-million dollar lawsuit. It could destroy um, our career. Many police officers uh, right now face legal difficulties and challenges that they've never had to face before. Whether it's right or wrong or in between, more police officers are being sued. They're being arrested and charged for illegal, unlawful use of force than any time that I can remember in my 40 years in this business. Some cases deserve prosecution, and in some incidents, a uh, civil lawsuit is definitely within reason. But in many cases, they're not. So the three Ds, disruptive, disorderly, and defiant, if we don't respond properly, if we don't handle the situation within the law, then we could face destruction, injury, our career, 
could be down the tubes. Disruptive, disorderly, defiant, and armed. It's a serious threat, and we need to be prepared for it. That'll conclude this webinar. Now, we have made the webinar available on demand. So rather than just a one-time webinar, we took our slides and our audio and combined it now into a video, and it's available on our websites at privateofficer.com, as well as our uh, brand new news magazine at privateofficernews.org. If you are not a member of Private Officer International, if you are in the security and public safety industry, then we definitely want to encourage you to join. Our members come from all walks of private security, law enforcement, public safety, loss prevention, bail enforcement, private investigator, and a whole array of others that have nothing to do with our industry. We have a lot of training, member support and benefits, education, news, and information, things that are just not offered anyplace else. So please go to our website at privateofficer.com and support us today. We also encourage and invite you to go to our um, college website. You can take online courses. You can take courses at our school. And we also have a program where we bring the class to you. We'll take our whole training uh, team, our courses to your school, church, or business and train at your site. Go to armor, A-R-M-O-U-R, college.org today and check out those online courses or courses available at our schools or at your business, church, or uh, school. That's going to conclude it for today, and we appreciate each and every one of you who have listened. Be sure to tell your co-workers about this training and others coming up in the upcoming months. I always tell folks when I end my radio show this, and I'm going to say it again here today, we want you to be blessed. We want you to stay safe. And it's very important that you have your head on a swivel at all times and have good situational awareness. And that concludes this training episode.